majestic, dramatic, or inspiring. These are the bridges that are worldwide icons, as well as engineering marvels. She's beautiful. Each of them broke new ground. The first, the biggest, the longest, and the tallest. I'm Rob Bell, an engineer. I'm on a global adventure to discover how and why these magnificent structures were built and to learn about the sweat and the sacrifice that went into their construction. Well, hey! I'm going to take you closer than ever before. Oh, this is magnificent. Inspect them from every conceivable angle. Oh, yeah. And meet the men and women who keep them working round the clock, no matter what. Check this out. These are the world's greatest bridges. I'm in California, driving along the Pacific Coast Highway. This road contains many great sights, but none as spectacular as the Golden Gate Bridge. It just doesn't get more quintessentially American than this. Driving a 1960s Chevy across the Golden Gate Bridge. And <laughs> when you were here, you'd realize just how enormous this structure is and how beautifully built she is. You can also see why the American Society of Civil Engineers named the Golden Gate Bridge a wonder of the modern world. End to end, it's more than 1.7 miles long. Its two towers rise 746 feet above the water. And between them, the main span stretches 4,200 feet across. For more than a quarter of a century, it was both the world's longest bridge and its tallest. Whenever I think of San Francisco, this is the image that pops into my head. But it's more than a symbol for just one city. This is an emblem for the entire nation. And it's not surprising, really, because the way this bridge came into being could only have happened here in America. Its story begins when San Francisco was a remote outpost of the American West. In the late 19th century, this was the biggest city for a thousand miles in any direction. In fact, it was the only city west of the Rocky Mountains. That city is on a peninsula separating the wild Pacific Ocean from San Francisco Bay, one of the world's largest natural harbors. It's the ideal location for a port, a port so busy that San Francisco eventually grew into America's eighth largest metropolis. In the early 1900s, the city's explosive growth had slowed to a trickle. Surrounded on three sides by water, San Francisco had simply run out of room. There were plenty of rural communities all around the Bay Area, ripe for development. The problem was reaching them. The closest place was Marin County, just one mile to the north. For decades, there'd been talk of linking this rural backwater to the big city with a bridge. And yet, the conventional wisdom was that it couldn't be done because of this narrow entrance to San Francisco Bay, known as the Golden Gate. The Golden Gate's small size hides a giant problem. The full force of the vast Pacific Ocean is squeezed through this one mile wide bottleneck. There are huge tides, strong winds and famously thick fog, even in the summer. On top of that, this is a major earthquake zone. Several times San Francisco has nearly been wiped off the map. As this was the only way in and out of America's main West Coast seaport, there was a huge range of strong opposition. One fierce critic was the United States Department of War. 
It believed no bridge could ever be built tall enough to allow naval ships through at high tide. But an even more determined opponent was the Southern Pacific Railroad Company. It controlled a system of ferries that were pretty much the only way in or out of the city. Almost all passenger traffic came and went from here, the ferry building. It was opened in 1892. It's a bit like a seaborne version of New York's Grand Central Station. Today, it's a trendy market hall, but you can just imagine that space down there crammed full of busy commuters every weekday morning. The ferry monopoly was a huge money spinner for the railroad company. But the service was coming under severe strain from a new aspect of American life, booming car ownership. The Golden Gate Ferry left from here in Sausalito. In 1919, it was moving around 120,000 cars a year. By 1929, it was carrying more than 2 million. Never mind what the War Department, what the railroad wanted. The people needed a bridge. There was one man who believed he could build it, Joseph Strauss. He took inspiration from a landmark in his hometown, Cincinnati, Ohio. When in college, Strauss became fascinated by this, the John A. Roebling suspension bridge. It was once the world's longest, and the man behind it, John Augustus Roebling, also created one of America's most impressive structures, the Brooklyn Bridge. Strauss idolized him and decided that one day he too would design one of the world's greatest bridges. He started a firm that built more than 400 of them, but almost every one was rather uninspiring. Then, in 1920, Strauss finally got a chance to emulate his hero. The city of San Francisco wanted proposals for a bridge across the Golden Gate and invited Strauss to bid. The few who thought such a bridge could actually be built said it would cost at least $100 million, billions in today's money. But Strauss put in a bargain basement bid of just 17 million. The city politicians liked the price, but would they really agree to a design as ugly as this? The Golden Gate Bridge. For 27 years, it was the world's longest suspension span. Today, it remains an icon of San Francisco and the American West. Keeping this 80-year-old landmark in working order is a never-ending task. That's why there's a permanent staff of more than 100 to maintain it. Bill, how are you doing, bud? I'm good. Yeah, it's for you. It's for me. That's for you. Look at that. Lovely. Let's pop that on. What's that? Good. Chief iron worker Philip Cheney is showing me inside a temporary scaffolding tent his team has built so they can replace worn out parts. One by one, along the length of the entire bridge, they're replacing the rivets with bolts. To remove a rivet, you've got to knock the head off. And to do that, you need a lot of power, pneumatic power. <laughs> well, there you go was once part of the Golden Gate Bridge, no longer. What's the kind of wear and tear that you see on the bridge? Mostly the rivets. They're 80 years old, even though they've been painted a couple of different times throughout the history of the bridge. The salt atmosphere around here is yeah. just so corrosive and evasive that you can never keep up on it. There's 600,000 rivets in each one of the towers. And that's just the towers? That's just the towers. This is Throughout the deck. Throughout the deck, there is millions and millions of rivets. Uh, this one here is pretty much a pristine rivet. Right. So if but you this can... one was on the other side that was protected from the wind and the, the rain. So if you compare uh, to this side here, you can just see where the rust has just eaten into it. So what then, these are being replaced by much more modern bolts? Correct. Unlike the old rivets, 
bolts can be made to an exacting standard, tightened to a precise tension, and easily removed and replaced when they start to corrode eight decades from now. Round-the-clock maintenance keeps the bridge looking as good as it always has. But originally, it wasn't meant to look like this at all. The first chief engineer, Joseph Strauss, had something very different in mind. Now this was Strauss's idea. It's a hybrid cantilever suspension bridge. And you can see the arms that stick out from the towers here on each side of the water. And they're supported by this, this mass of steel truss work on each side. And then between, you've got this suspension cable stretched out and the deck hanging off the bottom of that. Now, as bridge designs go, this is, um, well, it's certainly very different. I've never seen anything like this before. It almost looks unfinished to me. In the 1920s, the people of San Francisco expressed their opinions far less politely. As far as they were concerned, this bridge was ugly and definitely not what they had in mind. But with no other affordable ideas on the table, the city still hired Strauss as chief engineer. They did impose a condition, though. He'd have to hire someone else to oversee the design. Strauss swallowed his pride and brought in a talented deputy, Charles Ellis. Ellis quietly scrapped Strauss's original plan and came up with this instead, a graceful, flowing suspension bridge. Even the toughest critics agreed it was a thing of beauty. Ellis's changes were so dramatic that if anyone can be called the designer of the Golden Gate Bridge, it's him. His revisions pushed the price up from 17 to $35 million. Knowing this was his only chance to realize a lifelong dream, Strauss agreed to them. The new design was on a scale that dwarfed, well, everything. The total suspended section would be 1.2 miles long. But even more impressive were the towers. They'd hold the roadway up 220 feet above the water and then rise another 500 feet above that. Not only would these be the tallest bridge towers ever built, they'd be the tallest building of any kind west of New York. the towers so tall? Well, strange as it sounds, the taller they are, the longer the bridge can stretch. And here's why. As the towers get taller, the deeper the curve or the sag in the suspension cables between the two towers. And having a deeper sag in that cable gives you an advantage because the deeper it is, the less tension, the less pull there is on the cable. Let me show you what I mean. I have here three model suspension bridges. The difference is in how tall the towers are. I'm going to show how much force it takes to suspend the rubber bridge deck in each model. So I pull that up, got my bridge deck raised and supported. We've got 4.7 kilograms of weight of force that I'm having to use to hold this bridge up here on the small model. As the towers get higher and the cable tension lower, it takes less strain, less force to suspend the deck. All right, let's see how much force we need for our big model here. 2.4 kilos of force I'm needing to hold up that bridge deck there. It's pretty much half the amount of force that I needed over the small model bridge. And being able to have a lower tension, less pull, means that the width of the cables and the size of the anchorages that pin those cables down to the ground can all be reduced, saving you weight, saving you money, and saving construction time. All those savings translate into a longer bridge, but not quite long enough to reach across the Golden Gate. To do that, Strauss and Ellis brought in Leon Moisef, 
a renowned engineer who'd created a new way to build suspension bridges. His first was this one, the Manhattan Bridge here in New York City. It opened in 1909, and at first glance, it might be hard to see what's so special about it. But this bridge incorporated revolutionary new design principles. Earlier structures, like the famous Brooklyn Bridge right next door, are stiff, strong and extremely heavy. Under the greatest of loads or the fiercest of storms, they barely move. But all that weight creates a problem. If a bridge like this got much longer, it would collapse under its own weight. Moisef was a mathematical genius, and he figured that all the extra stiffening on the Brooklyn Bridge wasn't really necessary. In fact, quite the opposite. According to him, the longer the bridge, the more flexible it should be. Moisef designed the new Manhattan Bridge to constantly move, or as engineers say, deflect, up and down under the weight of traffic and side to side under the force of wind. If designed in a certain way, it would always return to place. Pulling this off in practice is tricky, but Moisef did it with a complex set of calculations called deflection theory. The Golden Gate would take this idea to new extremes, resulting in a structure that's exceptionally elegant, light and flexible. How flexible? When complete, the bridge would be able to bend up and down 11 feet under the weight of traffic. And as for sideways movement, well, it could swing much further than that. This plaque where I'm stood now represents the center line of the bridge. If I was out on the roadway, I'd have traffic zipping by on either side of me. But then to my right and to my left are two steel balls. Now, each one of those is 27 feet and eight inches away from that plaque in the middle. And in the most extreme conditions, this is how far the center line of the bridge could swing out to. By the late 1920s, the people of Northern California had a cutting edge design to be proud of. But it was by no means certain the bridge would ever be built. There was still a legion of opponents who spent years trying to get it cancelled. But little by little, Joseph Strauss won the backing he needed. Local politicians gave him their support, and many ordinary people borrowed money to finance the project. It took more than 11 years, but by November 1931, Strauss had achieved his aim. He'd defeated all his adversaries, and more importantly, he'd now raised $35 million for construction. For his colleague Leon Moisef, the Golden Gate would mark a career high point. Soon after it was finished, he completed another project that left his reputation in tatters. This is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge outside Seattle in Washington State. Moisef used deflection theory to make this bridge even lighter, thinner and more flexible than the Golden Gate. But this time he went too far. The gentlest wind would make it twist and buck like a bronco. People called it Galloping Gertie. This remarkable film shot in November 1940 shows the bridge tearing itself to pieces just four months after it opened. There were quite a few reasons why Galloping Gertie failed, and one was the sidewalls, which were solid steel rather than the open railings, as you can see here, letting the wind right through. And those solid steel plate barriers acted like a sail. You didn't need a strong wind like there is here today. The lightest breeze would set the whole thing in motion. And the Golden Gate has something else that Galloping Gertie lacked. I've been given special access to see it up close. 
Now, where I'm standing is right beneath the road deck on the north side of the bridge, as the bridge comes on to the north shore here. And what you can see around me, this seemingly huge tangle of metalwork stretches right along underneath the bridge deck over to the other side. It's called the truss. And it's not hard to spot that there's one shape repeated time and again within the truss. It's the triangle. I mean, they're absolutely everywhere, all different sizes and on every axis. And that's because the triangle is exceptionally good at withstanding forces from multiple directions. It's all about stiffening up the bridge deck, preventing it from twisting like Galloping Gertie. Being down here makes me appreciate the genius of both Moisef and Charles Ellis, designing something so delicate, yet able to take so much strain. It also gives me newfound respect for the men who built this, literally hanging in mid-air. It was dangerous work, and for some, it would prove fatal. The Golden Gate Bridge is rightly one of the world's most popular tourist attractions. It receives more than 10 million visitors every year. It's a great source of pride for Californians too. In 1987, the bridge celebrated its 50th anniversary. 300,000 people showed up, so many people that the center of the bridge, right here where I am now, flexed downwards by an astonishing seven feet. The half-century celebrations generated huge interest throughout the region and beyond. There was the same air of excitement on January the 5th, 1933, when construction of the bridge began. The tower here on the Marin side was the first to go up. And you can see why, because its foundations, its pier, sits right on the edge of the headland, making construction relatively straightforward. Not so much for its twin on the other side of the bridge. That one's right out in the middle of the water. Much more tricky. Before work could even start here, a specialist team had to make a hole in the ocean by building a circular steel wall, then pumping out the water from inside. Professional divers blasted and dug their way until that steel wall hit a solid footing. It was incredibly dangerous. The tides here are so strong, they had just four 90-minute windows a day when it was safe enough for them to work. You can see how rough it is here now. With the watertight wall in place, workers lined it with concrete. Though everyone called this void the bathtub, it was designed to keep the water out so men could build the San Francisco Pier. The concrete ring was left in place as a giant safety barrier. And in January 1935, the tower began climbing skywards. It took two and a half years to complete both towers, giving the whole of the Bay Area an incredible new landmark. And as expected, their height was truly impressive. But more than that, most people were also taken aback by something else, their sheer elegance. How could something so enormous be so graceful? And they really are graceful. It was all part of Chief Engineer Joseph Strauss's master plan. This bridge was going to make him famous, so it simply had to look good. For a bridge builder, Strauss did something quite unusual for the time. He hired an architect named Irving Morrow, whose only job was to make the bridge beautiful. Morrow was a risky choice. He had absolutely no bridge building experience, but he rose to the challenge, conceiving the whole thing as a kind of giant art deco sculpture. He added details like the ribbing and setbacks on the towers, 
and the unique lamp posts. He even turned bland concrete abutments into works of art. Morrow's styling, which you see all around me, helped make the Golden Gate Bridge a masterpiece of 20th century design. But his most important contribution was the colour, which he invented, known as International Orange. Nowadays, it's hard to conceive of this bridge without the world-famous shade of paint. Even so, it wasn't the original choice. Most bridges of the day were a dull grey, brown or black, if they were painted at all. But in San Francisco Bay, a bland bridge would pose a major hazard to ships and aircraft in the near constant fog. The Navy wanted to add yellow and black stripes, like a massive bumblebee to make it more visible. But instead, Morrow came up with this majestic colour. Not only is it easy to see, it enhances the bay's stunning natural beauty. By mid-1935, it was time to start work on the thing that actually makes a suspension bridge a suspension bridge, the giant main cables. And this is a cross-section of one of them. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. It's just over three feet in diameter. Even more remarkable is that this giant mass of steel is actually comprised of thousands of small wires 27,572, to be precise. And you can see them all in here. And up there on the bridge, each one of these small wires was individually carried from one anchorage to the other over the water by an ingenious method called spinning. OK, we're coming across. First, Temporary guide wires are carried across the water by barge and hoisted up the towers. A spinning wheel is then attached at one end, looped with the permanent wire. That wheel then carries the loop to the top of one tower, across to the other tower and down the far side. After 452 wires are spun, they're bundled together to form a strand with 61 strands in each main cable. Finally, the strands are compacted into a circular shape and wrapped in a weatherproof coating. By July 1936, deck construction could begin, and by this point, the bridge had notched up another milestone. In the early 20th century, construction contractors had a pretty grim rule of thumb. For every million dollars spent, they'd expect around one fatality. Now, the budget for the Golden Gate Bridge was $35 million, so it's not hard to work out. Yet, by the middle of 1936, the anchorages, the towers, and the main cables were all complete, and not one person had died. This involved more than luck. Joseph Strauss was a huge stickler for safety. Every man on the workforce was issued with state-of-the-art personal protective equipment at company expense. Historian Harvey Schwartz has arranged to show me some of the originals. This hard hat was used on the Golden Gate Bridge by a fellow named James Biondi. He worked as a painter on the bridge. It's made of steamed canvas, and it's impermeated with glue. So this would have been one of the very first hard hats used on construction sites, then, would it? Very likely one of the very first. You yeah. can feel it's, you know, it's, it's, it, I mean, it, it moves a bit. If something fell and hit it, at least you wouldn't get the full force of, it's, of say, a wrench falling 200 feet. It's so very different to a modern day hard hat, but it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. What would have happened to you if you were found not wearing it? You were supposed to be fired. Re it, yes. Simple as that. You were sent down the road. That's, you, yeah, that's what the workers called it at the time. Towards the end of construction, though, Strauss put out the, well, the ultimate safety device for the time. Yes, they had a safety net installed in 1936 when they built the roadway, it would extend beyond where the people were working in front of them and to the sides of them. 
once in a while people would jump in it. Just, just for fun. For fun. Really? Which, which was discouraged, but it happened. But it's, uh, it's supposed to have saved 19 lives. And they formed a club. It was called the Halfway to Hell Club. Oh, my God. Yes, it was. <laughs> because they figured if you've fallen, you've fallen halfway to hell. Uh -huh. You haven't gone the whole, whole way. Even Strauss's precautions couldn't guarantee safety forever. In October 1936, a young construction worker, Kermit Moore, was struck and fatally injured by a falling girder. His was the first death on the Golden Gate Bridge. But others were soon to follow. On the 17th of February 1937, a 12-man crew was working on a gantry hanging from the bridge deck. As they were adding some finishing touches to the underside of the bridge, the gantry broke loose. One man managed to cling on and scramble away from the danger. The other 11 slid off the gantry into the safety net, but then the gantry completely broke away from the bridge, crashing down into the safety net, shredding it to pieces. All 11 men plunged into the water below. Two of them a foreman named Slim Lambert and his co-worker, Fred Dumatson, somehow managed to survive the fall. In the 1980s, Slim recounted their harrowing experience for an oral history project at San Francisco State University's Labor Archive. Before we hit the water, I straightened up, let go of the net, then hit feet first. The only problem with that was that I jammed down into that piece of net both legs, and uh, that's the only time I panicked during that whole thing. I was caught in the net, and the net was headed for the bottom, and then I finally calmed down and began to wiggle, and I slid right out of it. But I was down a long ways because I was bleeding at the nose and ears when I came up. Despite his severe injuries, Slim lashed together a makeshift raft out of debris in the water. This kept him afloat until his eventual rescue by a fisherman. And then I saw Fred thrashing about, so I got him over the boards. I stayed with him then until the crab fisherman came in. I figured, my gosh, we're going to make it. Unfortunately, only Slim made it. On the way to shore, his co-worker, Fred DeMatson, died. I find it remarkable the amount of detail he's able to recall. And you can almost hear it coming back slowly, the the images of what he went through. But you can hear it particularly when he talks about Fred and being there when he passed. Altogether, 10 men perished that day. Slim Lambert, however, was back at work a month later and stayed on until the bridge was complete. The bridge was set to open on May the 27th, 1937. But instead of an official opening day, there was an entire opening week, the Golden Gate Bridge Fiesta. And this is a copy of the official program from that week. And have a look. Inside the very first page, there's an advertisement for a car. America had well and truly entered the age of the automobile. And this bridge was designed first and foremost for cars. <laughs> But the very first day was set aside for pedestrians. All cars were banned. Ordinary men and women had not just built the bridge, they'd put up their own savings to pay for it. This was the People's Bridge, and they came in their thousands to claim it. The opening of such a grand civil structure deserves recognition of those who made it happen. This commemorative plaque remembers the 11 men who gave their lives to build the bridge. And this plaque, in its distinct Art Deco typeface, honors the project's leaders. Over here, look, under the engineering staff, right at the top there, you've got Joseph Strauss, his chief engineer. In fact, his name appears twice. It's over here under the key officers as well. Where is he? Joseph Strauss chief engineer. But nowhere on this plaque do you find the name of Charles Ellis. Strauss had actually fired his talented deputy before construction finished, 
out of jealousy, according to some. And for many years afterwards, the man who could rightly claim to be the bridge's true designer was almost forgotten. It wasn't until the early 2000s that a number of key documents with Ellis's name were uncovered. At least one calls him designing engineer. In 2012, for the bridge's 75th anniversary, the American Society of Civil Engineers righted a long-standing wrong, giving Charles Ellis his own plaque here, ensuring that he too will be remembered for as long as the bridge remains standing. But how long will that be? The Golden Gate was built to last. However, there's a looming disaster that could bring this structure crashing to the ground at any moment. Even in San Francisco's famous fog, the Golden Gate Bridge has stood for eight decades as a proud gateway to America. It's also survived another phenomenon that Californians know all too well, earthquakes. Right here, I'm stood between two major fault lines in the Earth's crust, and everybody around here is simply waiting waiting for what they call the big one. In 1989, a magnitude 6.9 quake struck the region, killed 63 people, injured 3,700 more, and caused $6 billion of damage. Part of one major bridge, the Bay Bridge, collapsed. Remarkably, the Golden Gate Bridge survived intact. But engineers know that next time it might not be so lucky. So they're literally bracing for impact. I've been given permission to come down underneath the bridge's south approach viaduct to have a look at some of the changes that were made to the bridge. Now, what I'm looking for are at the tops of each of these vertical towers on this one and out there. These kind of black cylinders, they're hidden away behind the steel. And these are called seismic isolator bearings. Now, they may not look like much, but in the event of an earthquake, they're designed to work very much like the shock absorbers on a car, soaking up some of that movement in the towers from the ground shaking beneath and protecting the roadway above. Dozens of subtle alterations now stiffen, strengthen, and reinforce the structure. It all has to be done without ruining the bridge's architectural heritage or disrupting the never-ending flow of people and traffic. Although this bridge is admired worldwide, for millions, it's just part of the daily commute. Down the years, the volume of traffic has grown and grown and grown. Today, the bridge carries about three million cars a month. Keeping traffic flowing on the bridge has been a never-ending challenge. The roadway is only six lanes wide, and you can't make the bridge any wider. So how do you create extra lanes in that confinement of 90 feet? The obvious solution is to shift the middle of the road a couple of lanes over, adding extra capacity to the peak direction. For decades, they did just that, with the simple trick of putting down cones. Using road cones as a central reservation does have a drawback. There's pretty much no protection at all from oncoming traffic. The best prevention is a solid central barrier made out of concrete like this one. Each one of these segments weighs around 1,500 pounds. Even a spinning truck wouldn't shift that very far. But there's a very slow-moving machine that will. It's called the road zipper. And I've been given the keys. Since 2015, road zippers have been shifting a chain of solid barriers every day on the bridge. Understandably, I'm not allowed to have a go during morning rush hour, 
But the company that makes these million dollar machines has a test track an hour outside the city. Throttle along forwards. As I drive forwards, these 1,500 pound concrete segments are getting picked up on the front left of the machine, fed diagonally all the way to the back where they're laid down on the back right. Keep it straight. Whoop. Freeing up traffic for rush hour on the Golden Gate Bridge. Road zipper operations are overseen by Lisa Lacati, the first woman in the Golden Gate's history to be made bridge captain. This is an icon for the, the city of San Francisco. It's, it's a world icon as well. Correct, but it is also critical infrastructure. It's a major artery for emergency vehicles. And so it is our, my job to keep that open and, and, and keep it safe for everybody, all users. And whether it's helping them because their vehicles malfunctioned or there's an accident, and then, of course, we do have a suicide problem here, and so our officers every day together work just to help those people in need. Does the bridge have a, a history of a, of a problem with suicides? Yes, unfortunately, the first person jumped off the bridge within the first week it was open. Since then, more than 1,600 people have jumped to their deaths. To counter the problem, engineers are installing a new safety net, extending 20 feet out from the edge of the roadway. The purpose of the net is to, to stop someone from wanting to jump off the bridge. If you look at the net from the sidewalk, it will appear like you're going to get hurt jumping into it. And so the net is, is to serve as a deterrent. Should someone jump into it, we do have a rescue plan in place with our local fire departments. But the bridge has also been the scene of much happier moments during Lisa's award-winning 40-year career. I've delivered one baby all by myself and helped deliver a second. On, on the bridge? Uh, well, actually, they were able to get off to the shoulder, and, and we came to know someone who we weren't even aware of that had been born, born on, well. on the Golden Bridge. So there's been three babies born on the Golden Gate Bridge. Wow. 80 years after it opened, it's easy to see why so many still love this bridge. The spectacular setting the graceful design, the vivid color. But for me, this is a great bridge because it changed engineering itself. Builders around the world took its groundbreaking techniques and used them to build longer, higher, and safer versions with each new record-breaking span. Since it opened in 1937, 13 bridges around the world have overtaken its length, but none of them have been quite as elegant, quite as dramatic, or quite as iconic as the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, a lot of people say this is the most beautiful bridge ever built. You know what? I'm not going to argue with them. Sydney Harbour stakes its claim when the world's greatest bridges continues next Friday at 8. Next, witness the birth of the world's first superpower. Betterly Hughes presents an epic new series, Eight Days That Made Rome. On My5 TV next, the Pioneers of Pop Specials kicks off with the Freddie Mercury story, Who Wants to Live Forever?